didn't put the chairs back exactly. Because too many of y'all said you liked them, and not enough said they didn't. So, uh, unless I get a lot of ugly stares right now, <laughs> uh, we'll probably leave them this way. Uh, also, I meant to um, uh, make mention of this before, and I'll do it now since I'm uh, distracted anyways by the chair situation, so I just wanted to get that out there. Uh, we now have the ability to do online giving, and so if you go to the website, you can do online giving, but there's a catch. It costs to do online giving, so if your normal giving is, say, $100, it, it takes a 3% plus a 30 cent charge every time you give. So there's a little switch on there. If you want to cover that for us, you just hit that little switch, and then you can do that. And you can set up monthly giving, and you don't have to worry about, you know, coming and bringing your check and all that stuff, and you can be much more consistent. That, it's going to help me. I just set it up this week, and, and uh, I don't have to worry about writing a check anymore. I don't have to worry about any of that. And yes, I decided I would cover the cost of the extra cost of doing online giving. So just wanted you to know about that and know that it's out there and it's available to you. Just go to our website and do that. Um, so I know it takes the, the worship aspect out of it as far as the feeling of worship, but it's still worshiping God by when you, when you give, even if you do it online. Fair enough? Well, we're going to continue today our study in, in, in the book of Acts, and we're in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, in a, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, with our hearts full, Lord, with our minds settled. We've entered into our time of praise and worship. Lord, you have called us to your presence. And Father, I pray now that you would use your word, use this message to speak to our hearts, to bring us, Lord, comfort, to bring us conviction, to bring us instruction and in righteousness, to encourage us, Lord, to train us, to equip us. Father, I pray that you would enlighten us by your Holy Spirit for understanding, and I pray, God, that in all things that you Christ would be glorified in our service today, that our hearts and minds would be ecstatic with the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that we would rejoice in all that you've done through the gospel to bring us salvation and all that you promised to accomplish for us in the eternal now. Lord, we thank you for all the things you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, which one is hot? It's this one. Can you go bump that down just a bit? Oh, you know what it is. I don't have that dust. I mean, I got to go get one of those things that cover it. That's why it's making that noise now. Okay. So let's review what we have been talking about. Because it's been a little while. It's been since before Christmas that we started Acts. Uh, so basically, we saw the theme of Acts. The theme of Acts is the mission of the church and that it's under the direct control of God. The story begins where the, the gospel of Luke picks up, I mean, uh, uh, ends. It picks up from there. And Luke kind of gives a, a brief summary statement of his gospel, the things that Jesus began to do. Uh, and so the idea there is that, that we are going to continue that on and that the, the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ are left on earth to continue that work. Now, notice that, uh, and we didn't read the text today, but in the first few verses, he, he mentions the promise of the Father. 
that the apostles are commanded by Jesus to wait in Jerusalem until they receive the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. And by that, they will be empowered to accomplish their ministry. That's really the, the thrust of the book of Acts. Now, Jesus then, having been resurrected and, and presenting this, gets a question from his disciples uh, as to the nature of the kingdom. And, and are you going to establish the kingdom right now? And, and Jesus says, hey, you know, uh, uh, just that's not for you to know. You worry about what I'm commanding you to do, and that is to go out and be witnesses for me. That's your task. That's your, your focus. Uh, God knows the times and the seasons. You're not to worry about that. That brings us up to our passage today. And I want to uh, go back again and look at Luke 24 to read some parallel uh, passages so that it kind of gives us some more insight to the detail. Luke 24, verse 44 says, Then Jesus said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. That, that right there, could, we could do a whole sermon on that, just that he opened their understanding. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to open your understanding, to give you insight. You have to, to receive that from God. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted for, from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So there's, that's kind of a parallel passage of what we're talking about today. And our text today deals with the ascension. And concerning its importance, Stanley Toussaint says this, he says, The ascension of Christ marked the conclusion of his ministry on earth and his bodily presence. It also exalted him to the right hand of the Father. At the same time, the ascension meant that the continuing work of Christ on earth was now placed in the hands of the disciples. And guess whose hands they place it into, ultimately? Ours. Well, let's look at our text then. Verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Now when Jesus had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. These things, what he's what he's and he has spoken these things, that refers to his response to the apostles' question regarding the kingdom. So as soon as he you know, said these things, well then, uh, he, has, uh, he ascends into the heavens. While they watched, Jesus is caught up while they're watching. This isn't something that happened and then they heard about it. They, they, they sit there and watched him go into heaven. I, can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine that? I mean, they had some really profound moments. I don't know about you, but it would be kind of eerie. I, I watched a movie one time where some, somebody, uh, some aliens or something, sucked one person up into the sky, and you watched them go. And even in the movie, it was creepy. You know, it was just kind of like, wow. That would be a really, really weird moment. And yet they watched him, and, they're, and as we're going to see, they're just sitting there looking at him and wondering and peering into the sky. In fact, Luke refers five times in this brief passage to their looking and seeing. This stresses the eyewitness nature of the apostles' testimony concerning the exaltation of Christ, that they, that they saw him, they witnessed it. Now, he was taken up. Notice the parallel in the gospel. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. See, this is rather different 
from what they've experienced so far in these 40 days. Remember, he's appeared for 40 days. And he's eaten with them. He's done all these things. And so uh, in this appearance for 40 days, uh, he would appear and then he would just disappear. But this is different. As they watch, he's caught up into heaven. There's a finality to this. There's something decisive about his going this time. It's the last time that he departed from them. In fact, it's very much like the experience of Elisha. Do you remember uh, Elisha's experience with Elijah? 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha, Elijah, went up into, Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to, to meet him and bowed down to the ground before him. That's some interesting parallels there, right? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, being caught up visibly, the conferring of the spirit of the one caught up upon the one re that remains, you know? Uh, the, the, the conferring of the spirit here is important. Remember, Jesus said in John 16, 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, i.e. the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit wasn't going to come and enable them until Jesus departed. And he then confers his spirit upon us, just like Elijah's spirit was conferred upon Elisha. It's interesting to me that Elijah and Elisha probably represent the ministry of the law and the ministry of the spirit. Uh, in, their, in their various ministries, They're, they were characterized one more by, by uh, uh, what would be a, a ministry of law, and one more characterized by a ministry of grace. So there's some interesting parallels here. In fact, this, this idea of parallels kind of brings to mind, to me, that some more parallels that relate to the centrality of the mount from which Christ arose. Acts Chapter 1, verse 12, which we're not dealing with today, but it, it says this, it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So he ascended from the Mount of Olives. In fact, on, uh, near Bethany, which is on the eastern side. And so he ascended from this mount, and I want to tell you, there's some really interesting things going on with the Mount of Olives. This mountain becomes quite important in God's scheme. When I was in Israel, I had the actual privilege of, of not just being on the mount, but actually teaching about the Mount of Olives, standing on the Mount of Olives. That was a lot of fun. I got to teach about the, Arm the Battle of Armageddon, standing on uh, the mountain looking over the Valley of Armageddon. Uh, so that was pretty fun. Uh, I think I really enjoyed the, the Mount of Olives uh, message the best. Think about what all's happened on the Mount of Olives. and I don't even know if I got them all. But the first thing that I could find that was a clear reference to the Mount of Olives was that when Daniel, I mean Daniel, when David fled from uh, Absalom, he fled over the Mount of Olives, over the Kidron Brook and up the Mount of Olives and into the wilderness. And so he, he departed from Jerusalem at that point. You know, that's how God departed Jerusalem. Remember the Shekinah glory that was in the temple? And we see in Ezekiel that that they're all they're full of you know they're full of corruption and they've they've built these idolatrous things in the temple of God and 
really repulsive, vulgar things that they've established in the temple of God to worship. And so the Shekinah glory departed. Ezekiel eleven twenty three says, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. It's the Mount of Olives. And so the glory of God departed from the same way. And, 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 and seems to have rested there for a little while to see, possibly, uh, if they would repent. And the next, the next high priest that goes in there, uh, when he goes into the Mount, I mean, into the Holy of Holies, into the, into the inner curtain, you know, previously they would go in there and the Shekinah glory is in there and they could see. The next one goes in and it's dark. He doesn't come out and say, oh, the glory is gone, apparently. Uh, and they didn't repent. It's kind of like, uh, uh, oh, goodness, Samson, couldn't think of his name. Remember, he, he knew not that the Spirit had left him. Man, what an awful state to be in, to be so spiritually dull that you don't even know when the Spirit of God has left you. That's an awful place to be in, but that's where Israel was. Well, the next time that we see the Mount of Olives is in the New Testament, and there are a lot of things that, that happen on the Mount of Olives. Uh, one is that this is where Jesus, the, the place from which Jesus made his triumphal entry. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through, well, a lot of verses that deal with that. You just read a couple. It says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This is a, a description of the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem during his humiliation when he came the first time. Now, I, I, standing on that mountain, uh, there's when, we, when I went there and you stand up, over, there's several churches there that they've built. Uh, the, there's a garden there an olive garden, that these, these trees, these olive trees are almost 2,000 years old. They're not quite the same ones that were there when Jesus was alive because the Romans cut them down in AD 70. However, they grew up out of the roots of the ones that the Romans cut down. And so I, I've got pictures of us praying in, this, in, this, in the garden with these olive trees. And when you, when you stand on them, I meant to have the pictures this morning, but I couldn't find them. Um, and when you stand on the, on the mountain you, and you just see, you see the, the wall of Jerusalem and, of course, the, the abomination called the, the mosque there uh, that sits on the Temple Mount, uh, you can see that abomination and, and know that somewhere up there, there was the temple. But what's interesting is, is there's a road that goes down, and you know I don't know if it's the exact same path, but basically it's where Jesus would have gone down to cross the Kidron and go up into the uh, into Jerusalem, and uh, it, it, now when you go down it, you're you're swarmed by people selling little things of uh, of Jerusalem, little <laughs> fold out things. The Muslims just say uh, they're twenty dollars at the top of the mountain, and they're about a dollar when you get down to the bottom. So do, if you go, don't buy the first ones. Wait till you get to the bottom. The same people will come back and sell you. They'll circle around because you'll be here. And they'll be there, and then you'll start leaving, and then you'll count another group, and then you get down here, and that same guy's there, and now it's like ten dollars off, you know. And I bought one at the bottom of the thing for a dollar. I couldn't pass it up, you know. And uh, you know, so you get littered with these with these these pictures of Jerusalem. They weren't throwing their their tarps down; they were throwing down pictures of Jerusalem for us, but uh, for for a price, of course. But you get the idea. Jesus goes down and into. Uh, into Jerusalem from here. Now, that's in his humiliation. It isn't the last time Jesus will enter Jerusalem by the way of the Mount of Olives. He also, he also enters by the same path during his exaltation. In other words, when Jesus comes back, when he returns, Zechariah 14.4 says, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. This is, this is where Jesus comes back. And his feet land upon that mountain and there's a, an earthquake and it divides the mountain. Now that's the, the positive. There's also a negative. 
about the Mount of Olives. It's also the Mount of Corruption. See, it was often a place where false worship was carried out. 1 Kings 11.7 says, Then Solomon built a high place for Chemish, the abomination of Moab, and on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the people of Ammon. So on the Mount of Olives is where he built these temples and these, these altars for, their unknown, for these uh, not unknown gods, but for these false gods. Now, granted, Solomon had some precedent for placing these things here, not, not the abominations, but the fact that the idea of worshiping there, because uh, David used to worship on the top of the mountain. First uh, Samuel 15:32, David was want to actually worship on the Mount of Olives. Nevertheless, Solomon corrupted the mountain. He corrupted it with this idolatry and this false gods. It's also the place from which Jesus overlooked Jerusalem when he wept for Jerusalem. He sat on the Mount of Olives as he was entering, about to enter the city, and he overlooked the city. And he wept because he knew what was coming. He knew the judgment that was going to come upon the city. It's the site where Jesus taught concerning the coming judgments. Uh, Mark chapter 13 and verse 3 and following says, Now as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled. So not only did I have the privilege of sitting on the mountain, uh, and teaching about the mountain. I had this privilege uh, of sitting there where Jesus also sat and taught. That he sat on the Mount of Olives and taught his disciples about the end times. About what was coming next. So this mountain becomes quite important. And there's lots of other, uh, uh, in the New Testament, lots of other references to Jesus being on the Mount of Olives. That's where uh, Bethany was, Bethphage. Uh, uh, that's where Lazarus and, and uh, his sisters lived. There's a lot that goes on on this mountain and it's just to me that's all for free that's just interesting to me I, I love to see those parallels in scripture I love to see those kind of the, those kind of things that uh, just fill out the story for us if you would to give us that that context that's the place from which Christ ascended and it is the place to which he will return and remember he ascended visibly and so we continue in verse 10 and we see the witnesses of Christ. It says, and while, they looked, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, why two men? Who are these two men? Well, John 8, 17 says, It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Have you noticed that there are two witnesses present at all of the identifying events in the life of Christ? Well, who are they? Well, in, on the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, it's Moses and Elijah. Remember, two men were there, and they're identified as Moses and Elijah. Then as, at his resurrection, two men are, are there also, Luke 24, verse 3, but they are identified uh, elsewhere as angels. At his ascension, right here in this text, two men. And just prior to his second coming, during the tribulation, there are two witnesses. Maybe Moses and Elijah, I don't know. Uh, there's, that's all speculation as to if they are, uh, you know, there's, there's a pattern there, and there is the identification of Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. But the point is that there's a testimony, a witness to these things. This is not fairy tales. This is not just myth. This is eyewitnesses. And we went through the sermon on the eyewitness testimony of the New Testament. We have eyewitness testimony that Christ was transfigured on the mount. That at his resurrection, there was eyewitness testimony. At his ascension, eyewitness testimony. During the tribulation, eyewitness testimony. That there will be a coming of Christ. This eyewitness testimony is important. That we can have certainty in these things. That it's true. Because look what it points to. It, it points to the return of Christ. Verse 11. He said, well, let's back up in verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? 
This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, just like, why are you standing there gazing up into heaven? Now, in the, in the uh, resurrection story, at the empty tomb, we have the same kind of challenge followed by correction. Here it's been a galley. Why do you stand gazing into the heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In Luke 24, verses 5 through 7, it says, Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they, they said to them, uh, the angels said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. So, what are you doing? Why are you weeping? You're weeping as if it's over with. You're weeping as if it's, this is the final thing that Christ is going to do. But he's risen. Now, men of Galilee, why are you peering into the heavens? What should they be doing? getting to work <laughs> it's time to go to work because Jesus is going to come back in the same way that you saw him leave so it's the same Jesus and he's coming back in the same way all these people that claim to be Jesus the guy out there in Florida for a while and the guy in Waco for a while all the different ones that claim to be Jesus I didn't see them descend out of the heavens I'm sorry if you don't do that, you ain't Jesus. You didn't come back like he did. You're not the same Jesus. We, Jesus said, Jesus warned us. You know, people are going to come claiming to be me. Now, that's a, a great apologetic to me, by the way, because Jesus is the only major religious leader to ever make that claim, that other people were going to come and claim to be him. And even if the other, I mean, you know, yeah, people claim to be Muhammad. People claim to be Buddha. But they only claim that because of the prophecies concerning Christ, that he will return. And so things have built up about Muhammad coming back or Buddha had coming back. But those guys didn't predict that. Those guys didn't say, hey, a bunch of people are going to come and claim to be me. But Jesus did. I mean, he knew the future. He could see the future. He knew what was going to happen. He knew there would be a bunch of bums coming around and acting like Jesus. And saying they were Jesus. But guess what? They didn't descend out of the heavens. They didn't land on the Mount of Olives. And the last time I was there, it was split in two. So, unless that happens, it ain't Jesus. Got it? Don't go running after some guy who thinks he's Jesus. You won't have to run after him. You might be running from him. But you won't have to run after him. You won't have to chase him out of the wilderness. He, he will be visible to all eyes when he returns. See, he will come in the same way, the same Jesus in the same way. But until then, we are to be about the business of the kingdom. Remember Luke chapter 12, verse 45? What Jesus said, he said, But if the servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. There's judgment that is going to come. And we are, we are to, to be reminded of that, that, that we're to be doing our master's will, serving him, not serving ourselves, not living for ourselves, not living for our own pleasures, not living for our own grand design, but living for the kingdom. It's not easy, is it, guys? It is not easy. It's tough. It's, it's my full-time job, and yet it's still not easy. I, you know, it was tough when I was working full-time at a different job. It's tough even when people pay you to do it. it. It's not easy. 
but it's what we're called to be doing. Jesus, when he left, put the work into the hands of the apostles, and they have transitioned it from person to person to person to person to person until it ends up right there in Paul's lap and right there in Tyler's lap and in Linda's lap and in my lap. And we're all right here together to do the work of the kingdom. And guess what? We're going to have to answer for it, right? He's going to show up and want us to give an account of what we've been given and what we've done with it. Remember, our works will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. What we've done with what He's left us to do. Well, let's summarize then this, this whole section. The words after He had spoken these things uh, closely links the mission agenda uh, with the ascension and the angelic words that follow. Basically, Luke's point is that the missionary activity of the early church rested not only on Jesus' mandate, but also on his living presence in heaven and the sure promise of his return. So that, that he ascends into the heavens. What is going on in the heavens that enables us to, commun- to, to continue the mission? Now he sent the Spirit to earth, to us, to fill us and enable us. That enables us on earth. But what's going on in heaven daily? Huh? Intercession. He, is, he intercedes for us before the Father, enabling us. And so, guess what? When we blow it, <laughs> we have a mediator in heaven, the man, Christ Jesus. Remember, he went bodily into heaven? He's a man in heaven. Now, he's still God, but he entered into heaven as a man. And a man enters into heaven to mediate on my behalf. He knows what it's like to be hungry and to want that water burger. Okay. For him it was pumice or something. I don't know what they uh uh was it some more not some more uh was that stuff they eat over there? God, what is it? Huh? I don't know, heard of that one. Uh I ate some stuff over there. It's pretty good. It was chicken, but I can't think of the name of it now. Shwarma, that's what I was trying to think of. Shwarma. That's some good stuff. And I can imagine if you've been eating that all your life and you go out in the desert for forty days and you're hungry. Man, that's worse than, than being tempted by a water burger. You know? Because I ain't never been 40 minutes without food, much less. Been for, you know, I get hungry. I'm, I'm ready to eat. And Jesus went out there. And, and think about this, folks. There's a point at which we give in, right? There's always a point in which we will yield. It just, you know, the Lord says He's not going to let us be tempted beyond what we were able but make a way of escape. And if we don't get the way of escape, what happens? We sin. We sin. We give in. Jesus didn't have the, quote, way of escape. He just endured. He went beyond any temptation you have ever experienced. And he endured without sin. Nothing that you have experienced equals what he experienced. Nothing. I mean, it's the same kind of temptation, but you know what? It was far worse for him. And quite frankly, his suffering is far worse than any suffering I've ever experienced. I've never been crucified. Maybe mentally. (laughs) Some of y'all have crucified me mentally, or some people out there have, but no one has literally ever crucified me. The only time I've had any major trauma to my body, I was under anesthesia. The Lord has been through everything we've been to, through without sin. He lives in the heavens right now. He has ascended into the heavens to make intercession for us. Not only because we blow it, but because there's this fellow that has access to the heavens. And he reminds God day and night of how we've blown it. His name is the devil. And he accuses the brethren day and night. And Jesus says, I got that covered. 
You may blow it. But when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an intercessor with the Father. God's got it all covered. Jesus in heaven, the Spirit on earth. There is no excuse for not living a life for Christ. If you've been born again and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, there is no excuse. And so I ask you this by way of application. Are you working? See, Jesus is no longer here to do the work. He left it for us to accomplish. It's what we're supposed to be about. So in what way are you about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? How does your life fit into the mission of the church? How does your life fit into what He has called us to do? And if you are working, the second question I have is your work spirit enabled? Are you doing what you think is the right thing to do? Are you doing what you feel is right? Or are you doing what God is enabling you to do? That's going to be a focal point of the following messages as we go through Acts and we see the mission of the church and we see it empowered to accomplish this mission through the Holy Spirit. And so let's take today to examine ourselves. See, in order to be effective for the kingdom of Christ, we must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. And so I ask myself, well, let me ask you. I've gone through this process. Are you empowered by the Holy Spirit? Do you even understand what I'm talking about? Do you have any experience at all with the Holy Spirit in your life? If you don't, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, spirit enablement, walking in the Spirit, understanding and knowing that you have the Holy Spirit. If you don't get that, if those are just words to you, there's something wrong. And we need to talk. And we need to, to work out what the problem is. Because if you don't know the Spirit, you don't have the Spirit. And if you don't have the Spirit, you're not His. And if you can't point to the work of the Spirit in your life, in your heart, not just enabling you, but convicting you and changing you and transforming you, then you don't know Christ. And you have not believed in, in truth and in reality. You have not received the true gospel of Jesus Christ because the Spirit is a promise to us made by the Father that upon belief in Jesus Christ is granted to us. It's that gift given to us. And if you're not understanding what I'm talking about, you may not have that gift. You may not be redeemed. And I want to talk to you about it. Work it out. So let's go to the Lord. Let's prepare our hearts for the work. Let's prepare our hearts to walk in the Spirit. Let's examine ourselves to see if we have the Spirit, to see if we're yielding to the Spirit, to see if we're following the guide of the Spirit and what work to do. Let's go. Father, we come to you. Lord, our hearts can be so deceptive. We can so deceive ourselves. We justify ourselves. We rationalize our behavior. We rationalize the, the things that we believe and think and feel. But God, your Holy Spirit takes your word and applies it to our heart, shines the light in us, and reveals all the sinfulness that's there and all the unloving and ungodly motivations. And sometimes those motivations are what lead us to do, quote, kingdom work. And God, you have made it clear that if our work is not rightly motivated, if it's not done in the, the, the power of the Spirit and for your glory, then it's nothing. 
It's wood, hay, and straw. And it'll be burned up in the fire. And Lord, I pray that today that we would take that time to examine ourselves. Are we being led by the Holy Spirit? Are we being motivated by your glory, your honor, your majesty to do the work of the kingdom, to do the mission of the church? And Lord, are we trying to do it in our own strength? Are we trying to do it in the enablement and empowerment of the Holy Spirit? And Lord, if anyone is confused about what all that even means, I pray that you'd make it known to them and reveal to them, Lord, their true state before you, whether or not they're saved. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would do your work today, do his work today, to bring us together in unity for the sake of the kingdom, to set our hearts as one to accomplish the work, to see the mission done, and that we would be fully relying upon you to do it. I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.